Look at this abomination. It's a Volvo white GMC auto car with a setback front axle and a bad paint job. Can you believe someone would buy this thing? Crazy. Hey everybody, welcome back. Let's take a look at my newest acquisition. This is a tandem axle rollback truck and it really does have a bit of an identity crisis. It is mostly a Volvo, but it's based on an old white truck's design. And you can see it, it's got a Volvo badge here, a white GMC badge here. And I know for sure that the cab is actually still used on some auto car trucks. So it's a real mutt. First things first, it bears the mark of the beast, Richie Brothers. And uh, you like that paint job? It's like originally it was green and somebody, somebody whitewashed it. So here's the story on this truck. I've been looking for something like this for a long time, several years. And I kept talking myself out of it because it is very expensive to put a truck like this on the road. And if you don't have some, some work or some business need for it, it's not really, you know, it's kind of a non-starter. But I think I can, I think I can pull it off. You know, and uh, make a little bit of money with this truck and, and possibly justify the purchase. The other problem is that you just don't see these very often. Uh, you see a lot of single axle rollback trucks, you know, like for towing cars or whatever. But you very rarely see these uh, tandem or what they call industrial rollback trucks. And I've been looking at a few of them that were for sale. Prices seem kind of outrageous for what they are. But this one came up at the uh, Ritchie Brothers Auction House in Morris, Illinois. And I went up to check it out. And, you know, it's it's kind of rough. It needs some work, but I thought it was, you know, a possibility. So I went up to the auction and, uh, you know, got a bidder number and everything. If you've never been to a Ritchie Brothers Auction, it is quite an ordeal. And I've never been to anything quite like that in my life. You know, I've been to a lot of auctions, but that was something else. The trucks at Morris are sold like on a projector screen and they sell one truck a minute for about 10 hours. And the actual bidding process lasts maybe 30 seconds. So you have very little time to make a decision and speak up and you know, it's, it's a high pressure kind of a scenario. But you can see I was uh, successful and this little beauty followed me home. Okay, let's talk about the specs. The truck itself is basically specced out the same way that you would spec out a, a heavy duty dump truck, or at least a dump truck in my part of the country. So it's got a 16,000 pound steer axle, 40,000 pound drives, and it's set up with the Dayton wheels. It has full lockers on the drives, so it has the inner axle lock and also locking differentials. L10 Cummins engine and an 8 low low Eaton transmission. Now the frame has not been stretched but I suspect that this was not originally set up as a rollback truck. I think it was probably either a flatbed or a tanker because the truck has a double frame but the double frame stops at the suspension mount in the back and they stretched the inner frame all the way back to the pivot for the, the rollback bed. So I suspect that originally it was uh, some kind of a, a, a static attachment on the back. Spring suspension, I believe they call this a T-Ride. And it's just a spring across the top and the drag links at the bottom. Freightliner has a very similar setup. And again, Dayton style wheels. So this is how they used to spec out dump trucks all the time because the, the Dayton rims are kind of heavy and clunky but they're, they're super strong, especially for side loads. And then the spring suspension is the way to go if you're going to be off-road. Uh, you know, airbags ride real nice but they're, they're no good when you go off-road because the, you know, you're always going to have a wheel off the ground. And this truck has full lockers so it might be okay but if you don't have locking axles and you have an air ride, it's kind of worthless off-road. I don't know the manufacturer of the bed, but there's not a whole lot of companies that make rollback bodies. This one has a, a 27 foot wooden deck. It does have a winch. The winch is not the original. 
uh, I don't think because the, the brackets have been modified, but it does work and it looks like it's plenty strong enough for what I want to do. The controls to operate the bed are right here. They're actually just switches. The, the bed controls are all handled by electronic solenoid valves. And this is a, a non-ground bearing style rollback. So from what I've seen, there are basically two ways that these, these industrial rollbacks are built. And the other style, it, it has a outrigger support that comes down and rests on the ground. And then the bed actually comes back past the uh, pivot point and then you lower the foot and that lowers the bed. This style actually has cylinders up underneath of the frame and it can raise the bed first and then roll back. So I think this is a better setup. The wood deck is in poor condition so definitely that's on the short list of things to be replaced. Uh, here's a look at the winch. This big box right here actually covers the hydraulic motor that powers the winch. And that seems like kind of a, a poor design but a lot of these older rollbacks are like that. I looked at a few of them that had kind of a hump here. Uh, I don't know why they didn't hide the hydraulic motor somewhere else, but it's just the way they did it. Now one big positive when I went to look at the truck is the condition of the cross members underneath of the deck. You see it uses these mini I-beams and that's, a, that's the way to go. I looked at several Landall trailers and Landall likes to use square tube or rectangular tube for their cross members and they just they rust out faster than you can replace them. Uh, these mini I-beams are, are the way to go and these ones are really in pretty good shape. So, you know, the deck could stand to be sandblasted and painted, but it is not rusted out. Now one thing you really have to watch out for, especially here in the Midwest, is rust that gets in between the double frame. So you see the frame here, there's the inner frame channel and the outer frame channel. And they'll, they'll almost always have rust, you know, in between the, the flanges. And generally rust in the flanges isn't a big deal. Uh, but where you can get in big trouble is when the rust shows up between the webs of the of the frame rails and starts to pop the the chassis bolts apart or or actually tear these apart or or damage the cross members and you know back when I used to do DOT inspections that was one of the things that would be a showstopper if you had you know some some rust jacking between the flanges that's not a big deal but if you start to get rust in between the webs of the beams, it's not going to pass an inspection. That said, this truck does have some problems with rust. So here at the corner of the cab, there's it's rusted through. And it's the same on the other side. And then also on the other side at the back corner, it's rusted through the cab. The floor is in pretty good shape, but you know, it's 26 years old and it's lived in the Midwest its whole life. So what do you expect? Under the hood, we have an L10 Cummins. And this is an all-mechanical engine. So you see the little PT pump right there. And this is an STC engine, so it has the step timing, which, if it works, is okay. If it doesn't work, it can be a real pain. This engine is rated for 260 horsepower. I think it's about 980 foot-pounds of torque, somewhere in there. And it's governed at 1,900 RPM, so I may may turn that up a little bit because it, it won't even quite do 65 miles an hour. So as far as I know, all the L10s were basically the same torque and the way they got more power out of them was just to raise the RPMs. So I may, uh, I may try to tweak this one and bump it up just a hair. Uh, like every Cummins, it leaks oil everywhere, but it does seem to run okay. Pretty sparse accommodations in the cab. It does have an air ride seat on the driver's side, but... <laughs> That's about it as far as creature comforts go. So like I said, it's an eight low, low Eaton transmission. So if you're not familiar with that, it's a little bit deceiving. They call it an eight LL, but if you want to be technical about it, it actually has 10 gears. And one of the big problems that I have right now is the, uh, the instrument cluster has some issues. The odometer doesn't work. The speedometer doesn't work all the time. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, as far as I know, that's a that's a real common issue for all of these older Volvos. They had a lot of electronic problems with the instrument panels. So I'll have to tear into that and see what it's all about. Uh, in the meantime, I'll probably have to get like a, a hub odometer because uh, 
your apportion plates and your, your IFTA and all that stuff requires you to record your mileage. No air conditioning in this truck, but it does have a state-of-the-art climate control system right there. Of course, it doesn't work, but you know, once I get that fixed, I'm sure it'll be nice and comfy in here. Now, like every big truck that I've ever driven, it smells like an ashtray in here. And, you know, most of the electronics on the instrument panel don't work. And, uh, you know, no one bothered to fix that. But they did fix the cigarette lighter. I guess we could start it up here real quick. So this is your hand throttle right here to increase your idle speed. It does have an hour meter. I have no idea when that was installed. And then down here is your PTO controls for the, for the hydraulic pump to run the bed. So we'll go ahead and engage the PTO. So these are the controls for the bed back here. Winch tilt and slide. Well, there it is. I'm not sure what else to say about it. It's not pretty, but it's got it where it counts. And, you know, kind of matches the patina of my other equipment. Now, as far as, uh, you know, weights and everything go, the truck itself is pretty heavy. I think uh, it weighs around 26,000 pounds. And here in Illinois, we had to follow the federal bridge law, which means uh, 34,000 on the tandems and then the front axle is rated for 16. It can go up to 20,000, uh, but from my experience, you know, like for dump trucks and stuff, you can almost never get the load right to get all of the weight on the front axle. So 16,000 is probably fine. So yeah, this truck would be legal for 50,000 gross, which means I should be able to haul around 12 tons with it, uh, which is a pretty good payload if you think about it. And uh, the good thing about this truck it's under 55,000 gross, or I can register it for less than 55,000 gross, so I don't have to pay the heavy vehicle use tax, which is $550 a year. And then I can also drive in Kentucky without a mileage distance number, because that kicks in at 60,000 pounds. So I think it's a good stepping stone. So as always, thanks for watching, guys. And there'll be a series of videos about this thing it needs some minor work right away. I gotta fix a few lights and adjust the clutch and you know a few things like that. And then this winter I'll probably do some more in-depth work, you know, replace the deck and possibly paint the bed. And you know, it's a huge pain to get insurance and license and you know, IFTA and UCR and all these things. So I'll try to make a video about that, you know, as far as diving into you know, registering a commercial vehicle. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart and uh, if you are the kind of person who's you know mr. don't tread on me and you hate pointless bureaucracy and you know forms filled out in triplicate do not buy a commercial vehicle it is one of the most heavily regulated industries in the United States and uh, yeah there's just no way around it so anyway we'll uh, catch you guys the next time